We're going to start with this excerpt from Chapter 7 of A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, uh, chapter being Sex and Gender. I'm going to read a what is it? You actually chose the section this week. So we actually read the audio. We recorded the audio book this week. Um, both of us are going to be uh, doing that when that comes out, September 14th. Um, so <laughs> I already read this aloud once this week. Um, but this is the section you chose from the sex and gender chapter called Division of Labor. Already in the chapter, we've walked through sort of all of the all of the basic biology and evolutionary biology of what sex is, what sexual reproduction is, why there's two, you know, why we don't change sex, all of that. Division of labor. In many modern households, women clean the floors and men take out the trash. In some households, those roles might be switched. And it might be true that both members of a pair bond spend equal time doing domestic work, but it's fairly rare for both partners to do every domestic task in equal measure. This is division of labor. From many angles, the division of labor makes sense. It has even been argued that division of labor by the sexes is what made us human. Even if we don't accept that conclusion, we can agree that it's efficient and generally a good use of everyone's time. Saving time by dividing up the work leaves more time for things we might want to do more of, like play or sex. The division of labor can and has created rigid roles, however, many of which are outdated in the 21st century. It is useful to understand some of where those roles came from in order to determine which ones are unlikely to change and which ones might. From the earliest inequalities in investment in gametes, females and males have engaged each other and the world differently. Among hunter-gatherers, men have been far more likely to be hunters of large game, women more likely to be gatherers of plant foods and smaller animals. Hunter-gatherer women likely spent most of their adult premenopausal lives pregnant or breastfeeding infants and toddlers. When breast milk is all or most of a child's diet, the mother is effectively on birth control as she experiences physiologically induced amenorrhea. She cannot get pregnant when breastfeeding at frequent intervals. This keeps birth intervals relatively long and the birth rate fairly low. Jump forward to the human transformation of landscapes with agriculture and gender roles become even more constrained. Being tied to a particular piece of land, we were now more sedentary and had ample grain stores with which to supplement our and our children's diets at any time. Agriculturalist women thus experienced a decrease in the birth interval. Babies came at a faster rate, and so the birth rate climbed. This increase in fertility tied women to hearth and home, and we saw a concomitant decrease. I think it's concomitant. I think so too. Yeah. And we saw a concomitant decrease in women's roles in economic, religious, and other culturally important realms. Men and women exhibit so many differences, it would be impossible to catalog them all here. Before we mention just a few more, another reminder about populations is in order. When we say that men are taller than women, the words on average are implied. Pointing to the existence of your friend Rhonda, who really is quite tall, does not negate the statistical truth that on average, men are still taller than women. Some of the average differences between the sexes include that men have more investigative interests, while women have more artistic and social interests. Men are also on average more interested in math, science, and engineering. On tests, girls score higher in literacy, while boys score higher in math. And although average intelligence is the same between boys and girls, the variability in intelligence is not. There are more boy geniuses and more boy complete dullards than there are girls in either category. One interesting piece of neuroscience reveals that across several domains, including both emotional memory and spatial ability, women are better at details, men are better at gist. This finding manifests, for instance, in the average man's superior ability to remember a route and the average woman's superior ability to remember the location of the keys, the cup of coffee, the document in need of being signed. The differences between the sexes are found in babies and across cultures, too, so this is not some weird, weird phenomenon. Given a choice, neonate girls spend more time looking at faces, while neonate boys spend more time looking at things. And across cultures, work is gendered early. In an analysis of 185 cultures, in every culture studied, some tasks are always gendered in the same direction. Iron smelting, the hunting of large marine mammals, metalworking, all of these are done by men only in those cultures that do these things at all. More interesting is the tasks that are highly gendered across cultures, but for which some cultures curtail female involvement, while other cultures curtail male involvement. These include weaving, the preparation of skins, and the gathering of fuel, among others. This suggests that there is a value in the division of labor, even when neither sex is inherently better at the task. Consider also the Pueblo people, who have long been understood to be master ceramicists. 
It, has been, it had been assumed, given contemporary patterns, that pottery making was exclusively the domain of women. In Chaco Canyon, however, in the Four Corners area of the American Southwest, a different story is emerging. When Chaco Canyon was a rapidly growing religious and political center 1,000 years ago, the population was expanding, and with it, the demand for pottery. More and more vessels were needed to carry and store grain and water, so gender norms loosened, and men began doing this otherwise highly gendered work. What might we learn from these truths? We can learn that gender roles can be re-upped for modernity. Some men will prefer hearth and home to a grueling career that is facilitated by having a spouse taking care of the domestic duties, and some women will prefer the latter. But many men and women, we argue, will prefer. <clears throat> excuse me. But many men and women, we argue, will prefer to be restricted to neither domain. Without being slotted into preconceived roles, many people of both sexes will prefer a partner who is their equal without being identical. We can learn from a more nuanced understanding of gendered work that traditionalist appeals to women not working outside of the home or to men being dominant in economic and business matters are regressive without any nugget of necessity or truth. Historically, women and men have had division of labor, both in family units and in societies. But other than those tasks mandated by anatomy and physiology, gestation, lactation, there is little in the modern world that some women might not choose to do. Similarly, men are ever more welcome in traditionally female fields, such as nursing and teaching, although we shouldn't expect parity there either. Different preferences lead to different choices. Pretending that we are identical, rather than ensuring that we are equal under the law, is a fool's game. And one more, so we, we have a corrective lens section at the end of every chapter, and uh, the final one for this chapter is, recognize that our differences contribute to our collective strength. If we more highly valued the work that women are more likely to be drawn to, e.g. teaching, social work, nursing, perhaps we could stop demanding equal representation of men and women in fields that women are simply not as likely to be interested in. Recognizing that we are, on average, different is the critical first step to building a society in which all opportunities are truly open to everyone. Equal opportunity is an honorable goal in step with reality, whereas aiming for equal outcome, in which every occupation from daycare workers to garbage collectors has equal representation between the sexes, will disappoint everyone involved. Yeah, I, I always wonder if uh, those who apply these very um, naive equalizing kinds of uh, remedy proposals, if they have contemplated what it would be like to live in the world that they are imagining. Yeah, I mean, and this came up in the in that event that uh, that I did years ago now with James Damore in the wake of the Google memo. Um, th this this was very much, and, this, and that had Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose as well, and you introduced us um, back before we lived in Portland, but it was an event here at, at uh, Portland State University. Um, exact, exactly this came up, right? Like, we, we also don't hear the cry from the, the gender activists uh, for there to be equity in the sexes among garbage collectors. Right? There's plenty of dangerous or banal or dirty work that men are far more likely to do and no, that doesn't pay particularly well. And we're not hearing that we need equity there. Um, what we're hearing about is in those fields. And I actually, in that event, I pushed back against James, uh, James Damore a little bit um, because you know, it is true that um, the work that uh, men are more likely on average to be interested in doing does pay better. And this does have to do with historical record of sexism. Like, and we have inherited that. And this is, you know, in this way, unlike in many ways, um, the, the modern manifestations of sexism do mirror the modern manifestations of racism, where we have inherited an historical set of, of policies, uh, most of which don't exist now, but they're, but they're, Ghosts do, right? The the manifestations downstream still do. Well, I, I, I'm, I believe what you've just said is accurate, but I want to add another category here. So there is some sort of structural inherited bias against uh, work that has traditionally been female. Mm -hmm. But there's also an economic reason that that would exist that has nothing to do with any kind of bigotry, right? That because women are uh, saddled with or privileged with, whichever way you want to see it, the actual production of babies and their nursing, the economic model would predict that that would be budgeted right. in, right? And so that... Well, I mean, I think 
I, I know I interrupted you, but you know, a, as we moved to agriculture 10 ish, 10 to 12 ish thousand years ago, mo, you know, most of us um, have ancestors that became agriculturalists 10 to 12,000 years ago. As that, as that began to happen, you know, for a while, everyone was working to support their own family, and that might have been extended family. But um, as trade became more common, the things that men were doing were tradable and therefore monetizable. And the things that women were doing were less tradable and monetizable until very, very recently. And there are a lot of us who think that that monetizing of things like, you know, of reproduction and sex, you know, obviously sex has been monetized forever, but, um, you know, things like surrogacy um, is a brand new phenomenon. But for the most part, the things that are mandated by anatomy and physiology that women do um, was not brought into the market. Um, except for, you know, actually having sex, you know, prostitution is super old, as we all know. Um, and so the the work that men were doing, you know, being able to sell the grain to allow for um, to purchase things that you couldn't make at home uh, was was something that tracked men's work and not women's work. And, you know, we can we could think of, you know, putting up the food, you know, preserving the food, that was for a while anyway, more women's work, but it also didn't generate nearly as much of the potential revenue. And so you have this sort of, you know, initial um, inherent inequality, not based inherently on any bigotry, as you right, say. Right, not based right? In, in, in any bigotry. Now, it doesn't mean it's not structural. It is. Right. And it doesn't mean it can't be structurally corrected. It can. Um, but the point is, let's, you know, it's tempting to just simply demonize a system that has biases in it right. and then and those to jump to bigotry is the only possible bigotry explanation. is the explanation yeah. um and then as long as you're doing that the other temptation is to do it unevenly so all the crappy stuff that uh, men end up doing you know nobody's all that eager to democratize that right yeah. the the dying uh, as you're fending off tyranny the you know descending into the sewers to break up giant globs of fat right i mean <laughs> right like these are not things that women yeah, are in general <laughs> trying to break into so yeah. anyway there is something to be done there's always questions of fairness with respect to access, yep. um, but come on, these things just aren't simple, right? right. No, they're 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 really very much not. And I like, I love that work that um, that I was reading about with the 185 uh, pre-agriculturalist societies or yeah, pre-industrial societies. And you know, I've, you know, I, I used to teach with this a lot. I used to use use that work to teach descriptive statistics among other things. Um, but I think it, you know, it, everything in this book got so shortened because it has such breadth. Um, but in the, the point there about division of labor persisting in across cultures in across for many activities, but which sex does it varies is extraordinary. I love this. The fact that in some cultures, weaving is very much a man's job and women shall not touch it because it would, you know, sully the the weaving or the men or something. And in other cultures, it's exactly the opposite story. And of course, the languaging around it will come will be different, um, both because it's different cultures and because um, the reasons that we say that women shouldn't touch things and men shouldn't touch things tend to be different as well. But, you know, weaving, well, that's man's work. Weaving, that's women's work. Okay, both things are argued in different cultures at the same time on the planet. And that tells us there's value in division of labor without those divisions of labor inherently having anything to do with underlying differences in ability or interest. And the fact that that one goes in both directions tells us that both men and women weave well enough alone. Okay, that one will accept. You'll accept. <laughs> yes. Phew. <laughs> All right. Yeah.